The U.S. Department of Energy is cleaning up the Oak Ridge Reservation of residual hazardous and radioactive contamination left over as a result of decades of nuclear energy research. Much of that work has been influenced by the Oak Ridge Site-Specific Advisory Board, a citizens panel that provides independent advice and recommendations on DOE's cleanup operations. You're welcome to attend the meetings and be part of this important work. For more information, call us or visit our website. All right, so we are recording now. So Michelle, feel free to start and I will continue working in the background here. Fantastic, thank you. Well, welcome everybody. We made it to June, so that's a good sign. Uh, I'm not in the forest today with Dave, but uh, I'm hoping to take some holiday time soon. So definitely wanted to do some of that myself. So glad everybody can make it. I do want to uh, start things off today by checking in with our federal and state agency representatives. And Jay, I see that you're on the call. So do you have anything you'd like to share with us today? I sure do. I, I appreciate that. Um, I apologize for not being here the last time, but I've had some dental work and it was probably the best I didn't. Uh, Dave would have had an opportunity to make fun of me then and, and we, we avoid that kind of thing. So. Uh, certainly good to see you guys. Uh, appreciate the time and effort y'all put into this every month. I'm happy to be here tonight uh, and give you some updates on some items. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't know if, if this had made it out to folks yet or not, but we have finished the demo of the biology complex buildings over at Y12. Uh, we still have to do some, and all the waste from that has been disposed of. Uh, we still have some slab work to do. Uh, that, that is already underway, pulling up slabs. And there's still some, we've done quite a bit of sampling out there, but there's still some sampling that'll have to be done once the slabs are up. But uh, that was a pretty big milestone for us. So we're on track to having that project completed in the fall and be able to turn the, the uh, uh, property over uh, back to Y-12 so they can start building their new facilities. So we were pretty, pretty pleased and pretty excited about that. <clears throat> That, that was kind of the start of the major work at the other two sites. Uh, and that, that work, is, as we started the biology complex a couple of years ago, that work has really, really come into its own now. And so we have a number of facilities at both, both Y-12 and ORNL uh, that we have a lot of folks working in right now. Uh, over at ORNL, uh, they're mainly in the old uh, reactor row area and isotope row area where the <clears throat> up around graphite reactor, if you know where that is. And then kind of down the hill from that uh, was the iso what's known as isotope row. And so we're, we're doing a lot of deactivation work right now, preparing those facilities for demolition, uh, both, both in some of the old reactors that were there and also down in the isotope facilities or hot cells. Uh, and so that, that's pretty exciting as well. And then over at Y-12, we're in uh, <clears throat> doing deactivation work right now in uh, beta, uh, beta 1 and Alpha 2, which are two large facilities outside of PIDAS. Uh, we also were doing work in 9213, which was an old criticality experiments facility, which is kind of on the back of the hill there over, you know, when we go up on the ridge and you kind of see it's kind of on the other side of that, not the Y-12 side, but the other side. Uh, and so we're doing work in that as well. And in fact, that, that facility, we're on track or sometime in early uh, calendar 22, if not before uh, demoing that, that facility. And then late in 22, early uh, calendar year 23, being able to demo uh, beta one as well. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of skyline changes uh, soon. Uh, so that, that's pretty exciting for us as well, considering it wasn't that long ago that uh, we were finishing up ETTP, so uh, we're, we're really hitting our stride now. And out at ETTP, we're finishing up uh, work out there as well. Uh, and some exciting news, y'all probably have seen the TVA and Kairos Power had announced plans back in May uh, to do a demonstration reactor out there. And, and uh, if, if that comes to fruition, it looks like it is. That's about a $100 million investment. Uh, create about 55 jobs and the facility will construct 185 acre, uh, will construct on 185 acre parcel. So the transfers <clears throat> continue. Uh, we also have a couple of additional transfer packages that have gone over to 
for much smaller parcels, but have gone over to Congress for the congressional notification. So uh, transfers out there continue, which is a pretty big deal for us as well, because I'm pretty interested in, in getting us out of the owning, uh, owning property at ETTP. Uh, and we also are on track for submitting the new disposal cell uh, <clears throat> draft rod to EPA and TDEC in July. Uh, the milestone is July 15th. And as of right now, we're on track to make, make that deliverable. Uh, and once we do that, I did want to let you know that we're planning to have some additional, and, and we're still closing in with the regulators on exactly what that will look like. Uh, but on some additional public outreach uh, to go over things like waste acceptance criteria, site selection, wastewater discharge limits, et cetera. Uh, and then I guess the last thing is last night, uh, the president actually released the EM budget. And for Oak Ridge, it's one of the best president's requests that we've had in many years. Typically, our requests are somewhere in the low 400s. <clears throat> And then, of course, our enacted level would be, you know, high 500s to mid 600s. Uh, last year, for instance, the enacted level was 644 million, but the president's budget this year is 561 million. Uh, so that that's a big plus up uh, from the president's budget from what we've had previously. And a lot of that uh, is there's 275 million of that for D and D at Y12 North Health. Uh, <clears throat> That's 21 million higher for that kind of cleanup at Y12 and RNL than it was uh, in the FY21 enacted budget. So it, it, it's only about $80 million difference between last year's enacted and the president's budget. So that, that, that is very good news and it, it'll allow us to continue the progress. And even if we don't get the kind of plus up out of Congress that we've seen, but the carryover that we've got from the 21 budget, uh, if we do get the president's budget, it, we, we will be able to continue progress uh, with, at the current pace we're at. So we, I, I consider that a, a very positive step and very positive message for cleanup to continue. So, you know, for us, it was a big deal as, as work winds up at, that's in the UED and D budget, and we need to get the defense budget up because that's what pays for cleanup at Washington. 12 and RNL, and it seems like even with Senator uh, Alexander gone uh, now that uh, uh, Congressman Fleshman, Senator Haggerty, Senator Blackburn are certainly advocating on our behalf. So that, that was very good news for us because I, I was somewhat nervous, uh, as, as I think a lot of folks were, uh, that with Senator Alexander leaving that, that we might see a dip. Uh, so with that, uh, Certainly open for questions anytime you guys want me to take questions, but I'll I'll turn it over to Connie or or um, it, 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 or back to you, Shelly, if you turn, Michelle. <laughs> no worries. Thank you, yeah. Jen. Sure. Jen. Whatever the right protocol is. My <laughs> <laughs> Eve, I'm gonna assume you've got plenty of comments in your presentation. Do I have that right? Mr. Dave Adler. You're on mute. <laughs> I'm ready to give the presentation whenever. Okay, let's uh, let's hear Everybody. from your friends. I just want to make sure you didn't have anything else you wanted to share. Uh, so let me check in. How about you, Miss Connie? Thank you, Shell. I don't have anything to add at this time, but thank you. And how about you, Mr. Kristoff? I don't have anything, and uh, please. Uh, I apologize. I have a racket going on here. My wife just arrived and, and my dogs are you know, going ballistic. <laughs> no worries. No worries. All right, then. Well, we'll get started with the presentation. Let me cue up here Dave's bio. So Mr. Dave Adler serves as the director of the Quality and Mission Support Division for the Oak Ridge Office of Environmental Management. In his more than 25 years at DOE, he has focused primarily on activities related to contaminated site cleanup, waste management and disposition, and most recently on efforts to reindustrialize the former K-25 facility here in Oak Ridge. Adler holds a bachelor's degree in biology from Rutgers University and a master's degree in toxicology from the University of Michigan. With that, um, I'm going to hand things to you, Dave. I had to chuckle a little bit inside because I don't really think I had to read your bio. I pretty much know it <laughs> now. <laughs> 
yeah, I think, yours. We, <laughs> I think we can just skip that part moving forward. Okay, thanks, Shell, and thanks to everyone for giving us your evening again. Uh, I'm going to give a, a pretty short presentation tonight on the status of our efforts to uh, clean up the groundwater out at East Tennessee Technology Park. For those that are new to the SSAB team, that's generally the land area on the northwest corner of the Oak Ridge Reservation. Uh, next slide, please. So to set the stage for this, um, we are getting close to the time when we should try to make some decisions for groundwater at ETP. Say that because we've pretty much taken care of the buildings that need to be remediated. Um, we're closing in on finishing up all the soil that needs to be remediated. Um, much of the site has already been completely cleaned up. There are a few spots that we're gonna still go and pull some dirt from. And our general uh, commitment has been once we have the sources of groundwater contamination out of the way and cleaned up, they are no longer continuing to degrade groundwater, then we're in a position to start trying to make some decisions about groundwater. Another reason why it would be good to get some decisions made is because companies are beginning to come to the site and it's certainly helpful if you're planning a business and planning the development of property, it's certainly helpful to know what the future holds in terms of subsurface remediation. Um, and then the other reason is that we think we're about ready to make some decisions for groundwater. Um, we've had wells in the ground out there for about 30 years, um, literally hundreds of wells across the site. Uh, we haven't monitored all of them continuously for 30 years, but we do have a lot of data. And I'll caveat that by saying we could always have more. There's always uncertainty associated with uh, groundwater. But we think we're getting to the point of diminishing returns in terms of additional data gathering. We think it's time to go ahead and try and make some decisions and see what we can do to clean the groundwater up. Um, in the big picture, we should be moving out with formal requests for public input on our groundwater remedies over the next year. I'm gonna be pretty general, but certainly next, uh, next winter and spring, somewhere in there, we're gonna be asking for the public's input on, on groundwater remedy selection. And of course, we like to keep the SSAB a little bit ahead of the game by giving them these updates, such as the one I'm giving tonight. Okay, well, the picture you're looking at has two areas that I'd like to define. In the uh, upper left-hand corner, you can see two green squares. Um, very good, that's it. That area is called the K3133 site. Uh, named after the buildings that used to exist there. The K3133 site used to house two enormous uh, uranium enrichment facilities on it. They've now been removed. The soil has been cleaned up entirely. Um, the property has been through certification by the state and EPA. Literally a letter from the governor saying the site's ready to reuse. Um, it has been sold to Croat. And Croet is probably, as Jay mentioned, about to sell it to an energy company that would like to develop some, uh, some test facilities there. So that's all very, very exciting. That's the K3133 area. Just to the uh, south and east of that, on the other side of the creek, is another area, that's it, Shelly, um, is another area that obviously has seen a lot of development over time. I will call that area the main plant area because the main plant area is uh, where the main plant was, where most of the industrial activity was, and in fact is where most of the most significant groundwater contamination is. So we basically have picked two areas for independent decisions. The 3133 site, we hope will be a fairly straightforward one. The magnitude of the contamination isn't very great. The main plant area, a little bit tougher. We have some fairly there from a few sources. 
And that's the tough one. So we figured we'd pick one easy one, one tough one, test our, cut our teeth on some decisions and then move out from there. Um, there are additional areas out at the ETTP site, but they generally are devoid of groundwater contamination, little specks here and there. Um, we will catch all remaining areas after we've successfully shown our ability to make some decisions at these two areas. Next slide, please. Okay, now we're diving into the K3133 site again. Um, if you were out there today, the bottom of the ha half of the site would be completely covered up by equipment and buildings. That's because NNSA is currently using that half of the site for their purposes. On the northern half of the site, you would see drill rigs and office trailers because Kairos and TBA are out there doing their final uh, site suitability work, which we, we expect will lead to them acquiring the site and building these facilities on it. So that's the 3133 site. It's almost surrounded by surface water. And the general model that we have uh, been able to use for groundwater flow out there is that contamination emanates from the center of the site. There's not a lot of contamination, but what there is moves from the center of the site and flows laterally to the uh, surface waters. And then it's by and large intercepted by the surface water and anything that's there is pretty thoroughly diluted down. Um, We've been working this site and monitoring it for about 30 years. I'm not gonna walk through the entire chronology because it's more information than you really probably are interested in. But basically we've gone through a process where wells need to be with EPA and TDEC, gone out, drilled those wells, sampled those wells. Often that leads to another round of requested wells. That's not uncommon. And it, it certainly happened here a couple of times. So we've gone back with augmentations to our original plan over the years. Um, most recently, after the buildings were completely torn down, we were asked to go out and put a few wells to make sure that the site's groundwater table isn't dramatically altered by the removal of the buildings or by the presence of karst or sinkhole features on the site. So we just completed that work last year too. Um, we've done a very thorough characterization of the groundwater out there. We've analyzed for every chemical and radiological constituent of, of interest, and we have a lot of data on that site. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, yeah, I pretty much covered all this already, so the next slide, please. Okay, what did all that data tell us? Basically, it tells us that the water at the K3133 site is in pretty good shape. Um, for the most part, most of the samples come back at measured values that are below drinking water standards. Now, that's not entirely the case. We do have some wells which some of the time have measurable values that are slightly higher than the drinking water standards. But of course, the drinking water standards are a very, very uh, you know, aggressive goal. Um, by regulation and by policy, our goal for groundwater across the site is supposed to be full restoration to uh, optimal beneficial reuse potential of the site, make that very unlikely in the near term. But the general goal is to clean things up so that you don't have to place any restrictions on groundwater. Um, at the 3133 site, we're almost there without taking any action. The, uh, we do have a little bit of chromium in a few locations. That is not a surprise because a lot of uh, chromate solution was used in the water systems that circled around the site. Those water systems leaked. So we're not surprised to find uh, some areas with some chromate. We've also found a little bit of nickel, also not a big surprise given the amount of nickel alloy material that was used in all the process gas equipment in those buildings. But by and large, we're looking at 
uh, levels of contamination that are below drinking water standards or slightly above drinking water standards. Um, we haven't made a formal proposal yet, but I think it's likely that our solution for this site will be basically to monitor it and watch the contamination, the residual, residual contamination that still exists um, attenuate or basically dilute away over time. That appears to be what's going on now. It would be difficult to justify spending, you know, millions and millions of dollars on a property where it almost hits drinking water standards now. So we'll, we'll probably end up there. We're working with EPA and TDEC to finalize the uh, necessary documentation. At, uh, I believe it was TDEC's request, we agreed to another year's worth of monitoring so that we'd have a total of eight recent monitoring events. That helps us with statistical analysis of results um, to have a large enough sample set. So that, that data is now coming in. We're working with EPA and TDEC to get through a feasibility study and to a actually request formal public comment. Um, next slide, please. Okay, now we'll talk for a minute about the main plant area. Uh, this slide, this picture is taken from a slightly different angle. You can see the K3133 side up on the top of the slide and everything below is the main plant area. Now in the main plant area, um, the story isn't as happy. Excuse me, go away, Donna. I've got an old dog that's panting, sorry about that. Um, the uh, main plant story isn't as happy when it comes to groundwater. That there were a lot of spills of solvent material, uh, typically what they call halogenated or halocarbon solvents. It's the same material that you can go down to AutoZone and buy to degrease your engine, um, but in much, much larger quantities. Um, there were some lines carrying this material and sumps that contained this material that were used as chilling baths and for degreasing operations. Those uh, containers leaked and significant quantities, you know, many, many tens of kilograms of uh, solid material worked its way down through the soil into the groundwater. And because these solvents are heavier than water, they actually sink down through the water table until they can find rock or something to sit on. So that's, we have all of that at the main plant area. Next slide, please. Um, more statistics, you can basically get a sense of how many wells we have at this site. It too has been under investigation since the late eighties actually. Um, this says the formal investigation began in 97, but we started actually dropping wells back in the late 80s or early 90s. So wells in place at that location. Um, we focused very heavily on the spot that is the known worst location where there was a particularly uh, large spill of these halocarbon solvents. There's one area where within about an acre of land, we put in actually 96 wells. So that has to be one of the most heavily drilled acres of land in Tennessee when it comes to groundwater investigation. Um, and then most recently in the 2018, 2019 timeframe, we put in 31 new wells at the request of EPA and TDEC to give us a better definition of plumes and so forth. Next slide, please. Uh, just a visual representation of the number of wells. Every blue dot, every green dot, and every pink dot is the location of the well. Next slide, please. Okay, so for this site where we actually do have some problems that are worth solving, we've done a fairly thorough feasibility study of different technology alternatives that could be applied to this type of problem. And I won't spend a lot of time describing each of them in detail. I propose that we get into that at the uh, stewardship committee level when we can get into more detail and get into the data and costs and such. But basically a feasibility study has been done to look at several technical alternatives for addressing the groundwater contamination under the main plant area. 
the things that we've looked at include actually lowering electrically powered probes into the ground to heat the ground up and drive the volatiles off these pale carbon solvents. We've looked at systems that involve taking advantage of naturally occurring bacteria in the groundwater column that are there naturally and that actually can metabolize these contaminants. So they go after the solvent, they break it down into another solvent, another bacteria picks up from there and breaks it down. Ultimately, what you end up with is carbon dioxide, water, and I guess a little hydrochloric acid. Um, but that, that bioremediation is an in increasingly utilized technique for dealing with these types of solvent problems. And we've looked at conventional pump and treat type operations where you just drop wells into the ground and start pumping things up and anything you pump up, you treat prior to discharge. Um, it looks now like the lead horse, if you will, is probably a bioremediation approach. But I'd like to stress that with a groundwater system that is as impacted as this and is as complicated as this, it's, it's tricky to predict the efficacy, the, the uh, effectiveness of these technical alternatives. So rather than try to pick a final remedy for the main plant area, we've worked with EPA and TDEC and have come to an agreement that we are gonna put out something called an interim remedy, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a remedy that we hope will make things better, that doesn't break the bank, but that we will have to monitor and see how it works. So if we stay on the path we're on, we will likely in a couple of years go out there and uh, create access points into the subsurface where we can introduce food for the bacteria. The idea is the bacteria then flourish because they have a new food source. Of course, they things with the availability of food. They then are in a position to co-metabolize the contaminants that we're trying to get rid of. Um, we, we are not setting as a goal for this phase of cleanup, attaining the drinking water standards. Our, our real goal is to see if we can't just knock the concentrations down significantly so that the source of contamination, which again is now in groundwater and in some cases down in the bedrock, can have the mass of contaminants significantly reduced the thinking being that that shortens the time to when the area can be fully remediated. Uh, of course, there are some areas in the main plant area where the conditions are not bad and where we have a situation more similar to the K3133 site where we're hovering around or are below drinking water standards. Those areas we can just continue to monitor. Next slide, please. Okay, this slide allows some visual representation of the groundwater contamination at the main plant area. Uh, without getting into the numbers too much, areas that are in white are areas where we do not appear to have any groundwater impacts or any significant impacts. Areas in green are essentially the edges of the impacted zones where the contamination, again, we're primarily talking about solvents now, where the contamination is above a drinking water standard, but less than say 10 to 100 times the drinking water standard. Um, and then as you move inward from there and get to darker and darker uh, colors, we're dealing with more and more contaminated areas. So what you can see is that each of these big green blobs <laughs> tends to have a kind of a magenta, And the uh, actions that we're thinking about implementing would go after these more concentrated areas in the hope that getting rid of this source, which is continuously emanating contamination into the outlying areas, can be knocked back and we can make some progress. On the left-hand side of the chart is a, is a 
pretty conceptual representation of the trade-offs that we make when we make groundwater decisions. It pretty much boils down to with a lot of money, you can accelerate cleanup with less money, it takes more time. Now, under no scenario, scenario are we talking about being cheap here. Um, even the bioremediation type approach that we currently hope to be the winner um, is something that will cost tens of millions of dollars um, and take many years to implement. So uh, again, while the goal is to fully restore the groundwater, cost is obviously consideration. And we're pushing to make sure everybody can get vaccinated and so forth. We have to think about the millions of dollars we spend on groundwater in this limited area. Um, but we'll no doubt still end up spending a lot of money and then having a fairly extensive follow-on process of monitoring. Uh, next slide, please. This is actually the last slide. Um, so the take-home messages, um, and again, we can dive into this in as much detail as people like, but the take-home messages are that at least out at the East Tennessee Technology Park, where we're finishing up the surface work, we're finishing up the soil work, and we're beginning to see redevelopment of the site. Um, we think that after a few decades of groundwater studies, it makes sense of things. Um, we have put in all the wells that we've been asked to put in. I have no, no doubt that we'll end up ultimately putting in some more as, a, you know, as part of an effort to further refine and define our cleanups. But we think, as I mentioned earlier, that we're getting to that break in the curve where we need to start taking the information we've generated and try to use it to advance cleanup activities at the site. Um, but that, that is a conclusion we have to reach with, with everybody, our, ourselves, our experts, our regulators, the public. Um, we have looked at a range of technologies and we do have a lot of good engineering and cost data on the likely performance of those technologies. It looks like for the K3133 site, the best approach may be to simply have a, a top-notch monitoring network so we can watch the behavior of the plume over time so that we can make sure that the plume isn't creating an offsite problem. We will need to have groundwater use controls to make sure that nobody tries to pump water. Uh, certainly don't want anybody drinking water or pumping water and moving things around. Um, and then we think that it's reasonable to hope that over the next several years, we will see a continued reduction in the presence of any contaminants at the 3133 site. Um, over at the main plant area, we think it's gonna take some work. Um, we do not have a technological solution that will in the near term restore it to drinking water quality, but we do have some technologies that we think will make it a lot better and accelerate our journey towards restoration. Um, and then finally, we hope to bring these ideas to the general public six to 12 months and get feedback on our ideas and consider that feedback and then go out and see what we can do to improve groundwater conditions at HETP. Um, that's my last slide, but I'd be happy to try and answer any questions that folk may have. Thank you, Dave, for the presentation. It's always great information, and I really appreciate how uh, simple you tried to kind of make it for us this month. It's really great. I'm going to open questions up to the members of the board initially. If you have a question, if you wouldn't mind using the raise your hand feature, and Shelly will help us queue up. Do we have any questions? I have a question from uh, Harriet. Um, Dave, you when you talk about using um, you know bioremediation, are you talking bacteria, fungus? What what exactly are the critters that are involved? And a second part to that, I have a feeling Oak Ridge is kind of cutting edge on using these things, but are there any other labs anywhere in the world that are working 
in conjunction with you. Dave, you're on mute, Dave. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I'll just leave it off mute. Um, <laughs> we, we're talking about bacteria that occur naturally in the water column. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't look like we have to introduce any new organisms. Looks like we probably can exploit the, uh, the presence of naturally occurring bacteria. Um, it, it, actually, the science of bioremediation is becoming reasonably advanced. Um, we're now 20, 30 years into the ocean techniques on groundwater. Um, yes, a lot of work has been done in Oak Ridge at Oak Ridge National Lab, uh, identifying you know, which bacteria dechlorinate solvents, what the uh, metabolite products are when they, when the bacteria munch on the on the little short chain, short carbon chain solvents, um, and it's it's I, there's a lot more known than I expected to be known. They, uh, when you talk to the experts in this arena, they feel that they can project the general effect that a bioremediation uh, approach will have. What's tricky because th th there are always remaining unknowns in the subsurface. What's tricky is getting the bacteria to the solvent um, and getting the food to the bacteria. And of course, given there are fracture flow pathways out there, it's not just a bed of sand with water flowing through it. It's a lot of bedrock with cracks and water going through discrete channels. It's, it's just tricky to know if you've made it into every channel. Um, but certainly we can make progress and, and uh, you know, make things better. The question will be, how much money do we want to spend to just make things better? If, if you still can't drink the water, you still have to have use restrictions, you know, where, where do you stop spending the money? Um, so hopefully that addresses your question. Yep, that takes care of it. Thanks. Okay, uh, John. Dave, you uh, mentioned, uh, especially at the K3133 site, that the groundwater is ultimately uh, runs to the surface water. And you talked about the drinking water standards being the gold standard, for lack of a better term, that you were shooting for. What about the situation in the surface water where the aquatic toxicity standards are generally much lower than the uh, groundwater, drinking water standards? How does that come into play here? It, it does. Thank you for asking the question. I should have mentioned that in my presentation. We have to not only keep people safe, um, which we do by cleaning up the groundwater and preventing people from drinking contaminated groundwater. Um, we also have to protect the stream. So we have to meet standards in the stream that uh, are protective of the, uh, the aquatic biota. Now, if you can picture it, um, if you took a, a sponge and got it soaking wet, allowed it to absorb a bunch of, let's say, pink colored dye, and you set that sponge on the edge of a creek, the dye would very slowly ooze out of the sponge. But meanwhile, you have enormous, by comparison, enormous quantities of water going past the sponge. So you really do get, an, and I know dilution isn't solution to pollution, um, but you do get an enormous amount of almost instantaneous dilution right at the interface of groundwater and surface water. So it appears from all the monitoring that we've done in, in the creek there, where we know the plume is daylighting, it appears that just a foot or so from the bank, you're, you're well below any, any level of concern. But we absolutely do have to be protective of surface water with our groundwater remedies. 
And it would be, I, I want to be careful, an overstatement to assert that every drop of groundwater in the, in, underneath K31 ends up in the creek. Mm -hmm. There is the possibility that some amount travels under the creek. But generally speaking, the shallow groundwater is flowing into the streams. Thank you. Sure. Was that all you had, John? Yes. <laughs> okay, any members of the public attending this evening who have a question, please use the raise hand feature and let us know you're out there. Shelly, I'm not seeing any. I'm not either. Okay, great. All right, Dave, thank you so much for the presentation and for entertaining our questions. <laughs> My pleasure, thank you. So our next segment is public comment. Um, Shelly, I just wanna validate again, we have no public comments for this evening. Uh, that is correct. However, we will be accepting public comments um, by email or physical mail or phone call uh, through 5 p.m. on Monday the 14th for anyone who was at this meeting and would like to offer additional comment for the record. That sounds great. Okay. Are there any additions for the agenda this evening? Requests for new action items? Don't see any hands. Okay, can I get a motion to approve the agenda? Oh. Second. Okay, all those in favor, can I get you to raise your digital right hand? <laughs> we have left. I feel like I see a lot of hands. We'll let Shelly confirm. We're all set there. We lost Shelly. Oh, no. Okay, I think we're good. Okay, anyone opposed? Okay. Lower. <laughs> Get the hand off. The uh, Harriet's lower and hers. Okay, great. Okay, yeah, hitting it too many times. Motion carries. Our next meeting, everyone, is September the 8th. Um, and I'm just going to throw a, a comment out there. Make sure you take a look at all of the notes from tonight's meetings. There's a significant amount of information in there that you're going to want to be prepared for for some of those September discussions, particularly as we move into officer elections for the coming year. Um, so with that um, reminder, no July or August meeting, we do continue to have our EM stewardship meeting scheduled for the 23rd of this month, six o'clock, same time, same channel, see you here. This concludes the public portion of the meeting and anyone who wants to depart, you're more than welcome. I'll give everybody just a couple minutes and we'll move forward with our board business. Okay. All right. So for board business tonight, um, we need to take a look at our May meeting notes. I believe Bonnie is not with us. Is that correct? Uh, Bonnie texted me and said she's still having internet problems. So if someone else could fill in on that. Fantastic. The, the meeting notes are in your packet. I'd like to ask for a motion to approve those minutes if you've had a chance to take a look at those. So moved. Second in. Here, first and a second. Those in favor of approving the minutes, please raise your digital right hand. Okay, I think we're good. Let me see if I can lower hands real quick. I All believe, right. I believe that was unanimous, but if, I'm going to go ahead and ask if anybody's opposed, please raise your digital right hand. No opposed, motion carries. Okay, our next order of business is an update of the board bylaws. It's been some time since we've made any sort of significant updates to the bylaws. If you want to take a look at those in your packet, if you haven't already, 
Uh, I believe they'll start on page 41 of the packet, 41-ish of your packet today. Um, and the bylaws specifically related to the nomination of board officers, which is where the, the majority of the recommended edits exist. Um, I think those begin on page 59. But just to kind of quickly summarize what we're talking about here, um, really what we've talked about as an executive committee is um, removing the nominating committee nomenclature, updating the election procedures, and then tweaking student member section. And most of these edits have come as a result of sort of what we experienced this year, giving us a little bit more flexibility, particularly given the times that we've been in, seeing that there's some opportunity given these have been drafted, pre-technology really being in play. So um, draft of the bylaws and then the operating instructions, which are the companion to the bylaws. And there we've requested um, removing the naming, nominating committee, committee, updating with fewer actions and allowing for the distribution of nominees rather than having to present a formal meeting since anyone can be nominated from the floor anyway. And then from the election of officers section, a draft notice to include in the meeting materials, you should have those here. Do I have any other comments from the executive board there? Anything that I've missed? Anything we need to speak about in more detail? Um, I know that John had had some comments. I don't know if he's had additional time to consider some of that. Anything from you, John? No, I, I agreed with the uh, the approach that Shelley took. My only main suggestion was that, uh, that instead of the board, we use the terminology of the board staff in the operating procedure there. That gives okay. a specific group of the board that uh, will be responsible for doing the thing. But other than that, that was my uh, main concern. I proposed another alternative, but uh, I decided and Shell kind of confirmed that that probably wasn't a good approach to go. So there's no sense in really talking about that. Via board staff for creation of an ad hoc committee. I think that covers the spirit of your comment there, John. Do you feel good about that? I don't want to take away the option for the board to make a committee if it felt that was needed later. Um, yeah, so I think you know. it's a great call. That's a great call. I was just I was talking about the previous sentence, the first in the sentence there, where it says the board shall solicit. That that should say board staff will solicit. But either way, I, I, if you want to make it longer rather than a couple of words, that's fine. Could we do board, the board and staff, or board or staff? That's kind of what she's doing there at the end, via board staff or creation of an ad hoc committee. So. I like the spirit of how this is worded simply because it is our responsibility as a board to solicit the interest. So I, I kind of like that being a little bit more explicit at the beginning of the sentence, but I like having the additional flexibility um, to include the verbiage of board staff or creation of the committee. I think that satisfies what I'm looking for, but I'm certainly open to other thoughts or ideas. I'm okay with the language that she's proposed it there. Okay. Okay. Any other thought, thoughts or comments? I'm uh, just making sure I don't see any hands and I don't. Okay. I feel like this looks like a lot of changes, but when you actually kind of read through what's being changed, it's, it's not too terribly <laughs> much change, just more flexibility, um, all things considered. Committee Would you like to have a motion for this tonight or is this just for review? That's a great question. Shelly, where are we at with that? Um, if if y'all go through it and you like it, we can um, vote on it with these pending changes, but if you need more time or if you wanna make some uh, more significant changes, then we can certainly push it to another meeting. I think on the operating instructions, that was the only mm -hmm. page that had changes. Um, 
And Correct. then the bylaws update was a little more significant because, so we had the, the elections um, to give us a little more flexibility. And we also had some changes to the student things. So uh, are we good on, let me close this. Are we good on these bylaws that on the structure, the elections, um, we would prefer them to be held before the first meeting of the fiscal year, but as we learned last year, that's not always possible. Um, so maybe put them as the first item of board business at our first meeting. Uh, any other thoughts on that? I agree with that. It was unique last year, but I, I think that's a good change for that. A lot of that needed to be updated anyways. Yeah, we're, uh, uh, you know, we decided not to have an annual meeting this year as well, which is normally where we do those elections. So this would give us, you know, some flexibility in that respect this year as well. Any other thoughts or comments? Madam Chair, if there's no comments from the additional members, I would entertain a motion to approve that as amended on both the bylaws and the uh, other details that Ms. Shelley's noted tonight. And here's the other item, which is just for um, for area high schools. We have we say that they will participate. Um, I would prefer to put that as may participate to give us the option because obviously last year we were unable to get students um, and. You know, this year it's also been kind of dicey. So this way it doesn't read that we are going against the bylaws to not have students on the board. I agree. That's a good change. Madam Chair, I'll add that to my motion. And Madam Chair, I'll take the motion. I have a second. All those in favor? Can I get you to raise your digital right hand? Okay, I think everyone is uh, in favor. Okay, motion carries. Just double checking for myself to make sure we were on the same page. Very good, thank you everyone. And then Shelly, I'm assuming as soon as we get those updated, you'll send out the new version of those. Mm -hmm. and, and at that point, you know, uh, if we want to entertain additional discussion, then we could open that um, at, a, at the next meeting as well. That sounds awesome. Let's see. Okay. Our next item of business this evening is to talk about the election of officers um, to take office in October of 2021. I want to put a call out to everyone on the board to seriously put some, some thought into uh, making yourself available to serve as an executive board member. I will share with you from my experience, I've learned a lot being on the executive board that I would not have had the opportunity to learn and be a part of um, had I not taken that step to actually participate. Um, so I would highly encourage it. It's a really great way to learn more about the mission, about how we as citizens can contribute to this mission. And it gives you an opportunity to engage with the other sites as well in some instances for the chair's meetings, which is oftentimes a great way to bring ideas back here to us at Oak Ridge. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. Um, we do have chair, vice chair, and secretary roles for the board. As you know, the EM stewardship um, leadership roles are separate. Those are handled through the EM stewardship committee. Um, but these are one-year appointments. We do like to have those that have um, an interest in chair have, have served at least at some point on the executive committee. So if you have that interest, definitely would be great for you to express it now while we have folks who still have some tenure here, um, who can help you out and help you acclimate to your executive role if you're interested. Um, Shelly's popped up the information that really kind of speaks to what the officer roles looks like, what the commitment looks like. We meet once a month as an executive team. It is typically the first Wednesday of the month. Um, we summarize our activities, bring that information back to this committee, approve the agendas, make sure we have the speakers, make sure we're getting engagement from the EM Stewardship Committee. And as I mentioned, there are some travel opportunities as well, which the executives typically have first dibs to participate in those. 
Um, so if you have any questions, um, please raise, you know, raise those, send them an email. If you have questions now, I'd love to entertain those today. I'm sure anyone on the executive committee would love to help or the staff answer questions, but want to make sure that if you do have an interest that you do get that in by August the 31st. Um, so we have a time to let everyone know who has expressed interest. Um, and certainly folks can be um, nominated from the floor at the election in the meeting in October as well. Shelly, did I miss anything? Um, just want to note the, the list of duties there may seem kind of extensive, but just keep in mind that the staff is here to support a lot of that. So for uh, the same as for when y'all are developing recommendations, we are here to kind of handle a lot of the paperwork. So don't be afraid to get your feet wet. Um, and also note that the board officers, um, they are term limited for two terms in each position. And so as you can see, um, all of our current officers may not serve in their current positions again. Some of those people could, you know, uh, the vice chair could move into the chair position, but at some point, you know, we're gonna have to get some new people in there. So I encourage you to do that while we still have this nice cadre of officers that can help you figure it out. Any questions? Anybody have any thoughts you wanna share while we're all here together? Just uh, one other thing. Uh, I think you might have touched on it, Shell and Shelly, a little bit, is that uh, of the five people on the executive board now, uh, four of us are going into our last turn. So, you know, we need some new people coming on. And the, the best place to come on to the board is come in through the uh, stewardship committee because you know, that's typically uh, you know, getting started type positions. Doesn't take any, uh, uh, not a lot of knowledge of what's going on to, uh, you know, to fulfill those roles. It may sound high power to be chair of the, uh, of the committee, but uh, uh, you know, Amy does a good job and she's in her, I think second year maybe on the board, third year maybe, but uh, she hadn't been around for uh, as long as some of us have. So that's really a good place to start. And that puts you on the executive board and really then makes you in a preferred spot to move into the, the three actual officer positions. I will agree with John on that. Um, being on the stewardship committee has helped me a lot. I have learned a lot. John has taught me a lot, but um, being chair, I have learned a lot about the committee itself, and um, it is very educational. If I had not been in this position, I don't know that I would have learned as much or been as involved. So I do encourage everyone um, to think about taking a leadership role, especially on the stewardship committee. Thank you, Miss Amy. Okay. All right, moving on. Um, so our next item is the headquarter charge on strategic vision. And I'll share um, just a, a few notes that I took from that meeting. Let me pull those up real quick. Um, so that everybody has the benefit of seeing what we shared. And uh, those notes are in your packets. Yep. Um, so charge number two, this is the charge that I had signed up to work on is to identify an SSAB end state expectation and guiding principle that could be used as a complex wide framework for the interactions with stakeholders and communities. Um, so from that perspective, what we, what we really kind of talked about as a small group is we're gonna document our expectations regarding what completion looks like at each of, each of our sites. And this isn't necessarily what DOE is saying in state completion looks like. This is what we as a board or a community think it needs to look like. And then um, look for our gaps, right? So where do we have gaps? And then we're also going to document our expectations for how DOE EM will interact with local stakeholders and communities to reach that vision. And so we as 
chairs have been collaboratively discussing um, each of our board results. We are looking for commonalities so that we can develop a complex wide view of that. Some of the things that we've talked about as it relates to what we may include in a recommendation would be to ensure that the strategic vision includes hyperlinks that go directly to each site for ease of search. The documents typically a very large document and that may be helpful for folks to outline what we want to always be included in the yearly update and what that should be communicated to, who that should be communicated to, asking for regularly scheduled engagement and or updates via a variety of media. We know folks don't necessarily like to sit down and read an 80 page document. So how else can we share that information? And then ask for the strategic vision document itself to be written in lay terms with language that's geared to a non-technical level of understanding. Um, we need to define who we mean when we say stakeholders. So is that the public, communities, public officials, media, all of the above? And then uh, make sure that each of the boards are given the draft of the document in a timely fashion. So we are afforded the time to really provide some meaningful comments and feedback before the vision is finalized. And then we've also asked to always include information as to the workforce planning to support the timely completion of the overall strategic vision. Those are some of the things that we're thinking about um, putting forward as part of the recommendation. We'll continue to work on that. We actually have a meeting coming up week after next to really talk about our next steps and begin drafting. And what we put together will go to the meeting in the fall, the chair's meeting in the fall um, for review. So any questions on that? I know it sounds like a lot, but it's really pretty straightforward. Okay. And Harriet or Georgette, I think you were going to try to attend the other charge meeting. Were you able to attend? Is Georgette on? I don't know if I saw her. She is. Okay. Georgette, I see you're unmuted. Are you with us, Georgette? She may be having technical difficulties. Okay, we'll move on. And if she gets a chance to get back with us, we'll be sure to circle back. Um, Miss Melissa, um, anything for you for responses to the recommendation and the alternate DDFO report? Thanks, Michelle. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, we, you should have received today uh, the DOE OREM response to recommendation 248 uh, to your OREM uh, FY23 budget priorities. Uh, I have also, uh, we've submitted that to the designated federal officer and headquarters as well. So you should receive a response for them. It, it just may not be quite as quickly. Um, also, uh, I just wanted to touch base that we're still working on getting our next membership package through. Uh, I have received word that it's reached the EM1 level. And actually, Jay is supposed to be meeting with him tomorrow to discuss the package. So we're keeping our fingers crossed and hoping that it will move to that next level. Because for those uh, new people who don't understand this, after it gets through EM1, it then goes to the White House and then the White House has to approve. So, but getting it out of EM1 is our big step. It, and so um, we should know more tomorrow. Uh, that's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Melissa. And I see a note here from Georgette that she's having trouble with the audio. So Georgette, if you have anything that you want to share, if you want to send it over to the staff, um, we'll make sure everybody gets a copy. Anything you'd want to share? I was uh, chatting with Georgette and she said she will send me an email and I'll share that with all of you uh, as soon as I can. Also, I just shared the, um, the response to our recommendation. So we had five... Um, recommendations and there are five responses here from Jay Mullis, the manager. <clears throat> and these are in your packet, but also happy to send these back out to anybody. Sounds great. Shelly, if you wouldn't mind just to scroll up just a little bit so we can see those last couple there, give everybody just a minute or two. Uh, to the, the bottom ones. Yeah. Take a look at some initial 
That's great. Okay. That sounds good. All right. Look forward to any comments anybody has. It's a pretty speedy response. That's great. All right, moving on, committee reports. Miss Amy, what have you got for us from the EM stewardship team? What do I have? Well, we have another meeting coming up in June, on June 23rd, which you've already mentioned. Again, it'll be right here on this channel at 6 p.m. Um, we had gone over, um, there was a bunch of questions in the stewardship meeting this last time. And John had brought up a lot of things that um, really, really was interesting. And I, like I said, in our executive meeting, learned a lot during that meeting. Um, we also, I had also asked for recommendation, if there was a recommendation being warranted and the members had decided to what, hold off on that. So um, that's where we had left it. Great, any questions for so Amy? I guess we'll re yeah, we'll readdress a lot of it probably in the next meeting too. Sounds good. The issue group is still working on that. And so we haven't decided for sure whether we are or are not going to do a recommendation. Well, we look forward to the outcome of that. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you guys are really giving this a lot of due diligence. It's really great to see everybody so well engaged. For the executive um, committee, um, we pretty much covered everything that we talked about and um, we talked about the charges um, at the meeting. We also talked a bit, got a bit of a recap from Amy and John on the EM stewardship committee meeting and kind of what's next coming up on the docket on the 23rd. Um, I know that we've talked about the bylaws. I know that we've talked about elections. Uh, so I think that's pretty much everything we covered at the executive committee meeting. So at this point, I'm gonna ask for any additions to the agenda. Anything anybody wants to add? Raise that hand. I don't see any hands. All right. Well, with that, guys, this is our last official board meeting until September. So if you don't show up, I hope you do, to the EM Stewardship Committee meeting. I will see you there if you do. Um, I hope you have a good June and July. I hope if you're planning some time away that you enjoy yourself. Uh, for those of you that can attend on the 23rd, we'll see you there. And otherwise, have a great night. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Shell. Everybody have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. The U.S. Department of Energy is cleaning up the Oak Ridge Reservation of residual hazardous and radioactive contamination left over as a result of decades of nuclear energy research. Much of that work has been influenced by the Oak Ridge Site-Specific Advisory Board, a citizens panel that provides independent advice and recommendations on DOE's cleanup operations. You're welcome to attend the meetings and be part of this important work. For more information, call us or visit our website.